On the 16th of November, SpaceX launched the Crew-1 mission, where NASA astronauts Mike Hopkins, Victor Glover, Shannon Walker, and JAXA astronaut Suichi Noguchi flew to the International Space Station aboard the Crew Dragon spacecraft named Resilience. Just like a commercial airliner, SpaceX's Dragon is now certified by the FAA to fly private customers. This means if you can afford it, you can buy a ticket to orbit. Now building a human-rated spacecraft is no easy accomplishment. So today we're going to take a look at the Crew Dragon's development process to find out what kind of systems do you need on board a 21st century spacecraft? And how do you test and certify those systems before it's safe to fly people? Ultimately, it's my aim to find out how the Dragon has evolved since the very first prototype and how it became the world's first Uber to space. As a part of a top secret project, we've already built a prototype flight crew capsule, which is sitting on our factory floor right now. This is what Elon Musk told Space News in March 2006, after SpaceX had already spent a year and a half on the secret spacecraft. At this stage of development, the prototype included a life support system, but it lacked attitude control thrusters for maneuvering in space, nor did it have a heat shield but it would serve as a proof of concept and a valuable learning experience for SpaceX. In 2006, NASA selected SpaceX to develop their prototype into a fully-fledged commercial cargo vehicle that could resupply the International Space Station. They received $274 million US dollars under NASA's Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Program and then an additional $1.6 billion two years later for the commercial resupply service. The road ahead would be difficult and the stakes high, but SpaceX faced their challenge head on and began working on their first flight ready vehicle. The first version of Dragon, also known as the Cargo Dragon, would consist of a nose cone cap, a blunt bodied pressurized capsule and an unpressurized cargo trunk fitted with two solar arrays. It has a dry mass of 4.2 tonnes, is 6.1 metres long and 3.7 metres wide. And although it will never fly crew, it's able to send 6 tonnes to the International Space Station and return up to 3.5 tonnes, which is pretty substantial. Through this potato, we can see initial testing of the solar panels. These are folded up against the side of the trunk and are covered by a fairing through liftoff and ascent and are only deployed once the spacecraft has reached orbit. Once unfurled, they would produce around 5 kilowatts of power for the Dragon. To control the attitude and position of the Dragon in flight, there was a total of 18 Draco thrusters positioned all around the spacecraft. Each of these use hypergolic propellant to produce up to 100 pounds of thrust each. As a part of the vehicle's Reaction Control System, or RCS, here the thrusters fire to manage the spacecraft's orientation when re-entering Earth's atmosphere. As it hits the atmosphere, the capsule experiences temperatures upwards of 1,600 degrees Celsius, so some thermal protection is needed. For this, SpaceX would use a Pika-X heat shield, which was manufactured in-house but based on a material developed by NASA called Phenolic Impregnated Carbon Ablator, or Pika. Once the Dragon has passed through the re-entry stage and begun to slow down in the thicker parts of the atmosphere, the chutes are deployed and bring the spacecraft down for a soft landing in the ocean. In 2010, we saw a test article version of Dragon undergoing parachute testing using a Sky Crane helicopter. At this point, SpaceX had spent four years working on the Dragon. With help from NASA, they had tested everything they could on the ground and in small-scale tests. So on December 8, 2010, just months after their final parachute test, it was time for Dragon to fly its first mission to orbit the Earth. On its maiden flight, the Dragon showcased its ability to perform orbital maneuvers, to receive and respond to ground commands from SpaceX Mission Control and to communicate with NASA's Tracking and Data Relay satellite system. 
The mission's success allowed SpaceX to advance its testing campaign, and NASA merged the second and third tests into a single flight known as the Dragon C2 Plus mission. The Dragon launched atop a Falcon 9 rocket from Cape Canaveral on the 22nd of May 2012, and within three days had completed all of the initial objectives. Dragon tested its navigation systems and abort procedures before rendezvousing with the ISS, being captured by the station's Canadarm2 and then connected or berthed to space station. This was the world's first privately built and operated spacecraft to rendezvous and berth with the International Space Station. And at the moment the Dragon was captured by the station's robotic arm, astronaut Don Pettit said this. You did it. You crazy son of a bitch, you did The Dragon unberthed from the ISS on October 28, 2012, re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and landed safely off the coast of California under parachute. All objectives from the C-1 and C-2 Plus missions were completed successfully, and the Falcon 9 and Dragon became certified by NASA to start regular commercial cargo missions to the space station. SpaceX had done it. They had completed a significant milestone and with help from NASA, started a new and commercial age of spaceflight. A couple of months later, SpaceX released a video that shows a proposed crew variant of the Dragon. The trunk still has solar panels which deploy outwards and the overall dimensions of the capsule look about the same. However, on the inside, we see seating for up to seven passengers and some touchscreen displays for the crew to control the vehicle. Other than the abort system motors seen here, there aren't too many visible changes to the concept. These actually represent a new kind of re-entry and recovery process for the Dragon. We see powerful thrusters around the vehicle, which slow the spacecraft down for a touchdown on land, or what's known as a propulsive landing. If your goal is to improve reusability, a propulsive land landing can really help. Every time you have to fish a capsule or any kind of space hardware out of the ocean, you're spending a lot of time and money to recover and then refurbish that. Landing on land takes the seawater out of the equation. Whilst providing low Earth orbit transportation to NASA, SpaceX continued innovating on their crew variant. Two years go by and we come to May 29th, 2014 where we got to see the next evolution of the Dragon revealed. Standing under its predecessor from the COTS-1 mission, Elon announced that SpaceX had achieved a step change in spacecraft technology and revealed the Dragon 2. This would become the world's first commercial orbital spaceship capable of carrying up to seven astronauts. SpaceX would continue using a blunt body pressurized capsule design, but there was a new form factor. The Dragon had grown 2 metres, now standing at 8.1 metres, and was slightly wider too at 4 metres rather than 3.7. And although the Dragon 2 is heavier than its predecessor, weighing it around 12 tonnes, it can still send 6 tonnes to LEO and return up to 3 tonnes to Earth. And as it re-enters, it will use a third generation of the Pika X tiles. The upgraded nose cone would no longer be jettisoned and lost to the void, but rather was permanently connected and flipped back to reveal the forward Draco thrusters and the docking adapter. SpaceX now also had an upgraded docking mechanism based on the new commercial standard. But more importantly, the Dragon could now dock directly with the space station without assistance from the robotic arm. The trunk had also seen major upgrades and now had an integrated solar array rather than two unfurling ones. With the addition of some aerodynamic services or fins at the aft end, the Dragon 2 could now also better maintain control as it flies through the air after what's known as an emergency abort. To perform this kind of crazy maneuver, the Cargo Dragon also had some new wings. Some shiny new 3D printed rocket wings called Super Dracos. Shown here during test firings in McGregor, Texas, these engines are powerful enough to provide an escape capability all the way to orbit. We're talking some serious power upgrades. Each Super Draco produces a whopping 16,400 pounds of thrust, and with eight liquid-fueled engines clustered in pairs surrounding the vehicle, 
These all combine to produce a total of 131,200 pounds of yeet. That's the same amount of thrust produced by two Boeing 747-400s running at full power, accelerating something with the size and weight of a Silverado pickup truck. The prophecy is true. Okay, let's recap. What are the main upgrades SpaceX implemented from Cargo Dragon to Crew Dragon? Well, of course, it is now capable of sending up to seven astronauts to space rather than zero. It has a reusable nose cone. It has a new trunk with integrated fins and solar arrays. It has a new docking mechanism for autonomously or under pilot docking. It also has an upgraded third generation Pika X heat shield and is aimed to perform propulsive landings with the accuracy of a helicopter. But we'll put a little asterisk next to that and come back to that. While SpaceX continued launching NASA's CRS missions with Cargo Dragon, they also moved closer and closer to their next major milestone of launching American astronauts on an American rocket from American soil. First, SpaceX would need to complete a series of tests and demonstration missions with the Block 5 Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. About a year after the Dragon was unveiled, SpaceX conducted a pad abort test to validate the new launch abort system. Inside, there was also a test dummy embedded with a suite of sensors, but the primary objective was to capture as much data as possible about the Super Draco's performance. After all the propellant had been consumed, the Super Dracos cut off and the Dragon coast to an altitude of 1500 meters before eventually deploying the Drogue parachute. A Drogue chute is basically a smaller chute that deploys or pulls out the larger main parachutes. These mains allowed for the Crew Dragon test vehicle to splash down at T plus 99 seconds. From there it was recovered by boat and brought back to shore for analysis. More footage of Super Draco testing was released six months later, where Dragon executed a propulsive hover test at the company's rocket development facility in McGregor, Texas. With a tether secured to the top of the vehicle, the eight hypergolic thirsty Super Draco thrusters throttle up to generate around 33,000 pounds of thrust, lifting the Crew Dragon into a five second hover before throttling down and returning the vehicle to a resting position. All right, time to get serious now. Ultimately, the Crew Dragon would have to demonstrate its capabilities in a complete end-to-end -end test, simulating a brief duration mission to and from the International Space Station. On March 2nd, 2019, SpaceX launched Crew Dragon's first demonstration mission, or Demo-1, from Launch Complex 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. A little over 24 hours after liftoff, the Crew Dragon became the first American spacecraft to autonomously dock with the International Space Station. A couple of days of checkouts and Dragon undocked, successfully re-entered and splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean in the early morning of the 8th of March 2019. The test flight did not have any humans on board, but it did have another test dummy, named Ripley which would record measurements about the experience being strapped into the spacecraft for the full duration of the mission. Ripley would be wearing the Dragon IVA suit. This fireproof and airtight suit is designed to be worn inside the spacecraft and not out in the vacuum of space. The suit is also a critical subsystem of the Dragon. When the astronauts get on board, they are strapped in and connect a set of umbilicals from the suit to their seat. In its normal configuration, it provides air to the suits to keep the astronauts cool, but if depressurization of the spacecraft occurs, the umbilicals will immediately provide gas to the suit to maintain a suitable pressure and keep the astronauts safe. Moving on to the 19th of January 2020, where we saw the in-flight abort test. This most spectacular test was conducted at Launch Complex 39A and demonstrated the Crew Dragon's ability to reliably carry crew to safety in the unlikely event of an emergency during Falcon 9's flight to space. At around T plus 90 seconds during maximum dynamic pressure or max Q, the two-stage liquid-fueled rocket purposefully shut down one of its engines. The flight computers then interpreted this as a loss of thrust and activated the Super Draco engines, 
propelling the capsule safely away from the rocket. After a few more seconds, the Falcon 9 first and second stage begins to lose control before violently erupting into a ball of fire, exploding from the extreme aerodynamic forces it experienced as it tilted into the airstream. At this time, the Crew Dragon had flown itself to a safe distance and set itself up for trunk deployment, shortly followed by the parachutes and a safe splashdown. The Crew Dragon had done well, and if there were people on board, they would have had one hell of a ride. Before we continue with more testing, I'd like to make a retrospective note. During the unveiling back in 2014, Elon announced that the Crew Dragon would retain the parachutes from the Cargo Dragon and use its thrusters to perform a propulsive landing. However, this kind of recovery turned out to be extremely difficult to master and to get crews certified. Elon's dreams for a propulsive landing spacecraft were shelved and SpaceX had returned to using parachutes. This time, they had a new design, however, known as the Mark III chutes. During an interview on October 10th, 2019, Elon Musk announced that SpaceX was looking for at least 10 successful tests in a row before launching astronauts. The chutes, which were manufactured by a company called Airborne Systems, are made from xylon, which is an extremely strong material, 1.6 times more durable than Kevlar. They had also improved the stitching pattern to improve the parachute's weight distribution. NASA and SpaceX tested the Mark III chutes 27 times, validating the margins of the system, monitoring performance through many different regimes of flight. 30th of May 2020, and SpaceX has one final test. Astronauts and test pilots Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley are to fly aboard the Crew Dragon named Endeavour. After a successful liftoff at 3.22pm Eastern Time, the rocket accelerated the Dragon to approximately 27,000 km per hour, putting it on course to intercept the ISS. Once in orbit, the crew and the SpaceX mission control verified the spacecraft was performing as intended by testing the environmental control systems, the manoeuvring thrusters, the touchscreen displays, and many other subsystems on board. There was successful docking on the 31st of May, and Behnken and Hurley would spend the next 62 days on the ISS as part of Expedition 63. At the end of the mission, Endeavour splashed down and became the first capsule to perform a water landing with astronauts since 1975. Once the astronauts and Dragon were pulled from the waves by SpaceX's recovery vessel, they were returned safely to land, and the Demo-2 mission was marked as a smooth success. For NASA and the general public, this mission marked the return of human spaceflight capabilities to the United States since the conclusion of the Space Shuttle program in 2011. For SpaceX, this meant they had finally received human rating certification for the Dragon spacecraft and could henceforth begin commercial FAA-approved flights to space. With the last flight of Dragon version 1 having launched on the 7th of March last year, from here on out, the Dragon V2 will serve as both a crew and cargo vehicle. The 21st Commercial Resupply Services mission and first mission for the new cargo variant of the Dragon launched on the 6th of December 2020. It launched without seats, touchscreens or controls, most of the live support system and the Super Draco abort engines, but it did have almost three tons of supplies and science for the International Space Station. From as early as 2004, SpaceX have spent hundreds of thousands of hours designing, manufacturing, testing and operating their Dragon spacecraft. That's 16 years of development across two vehicles before allowing humans on board. Which sounds like a long time, but in the field of aerospace, it's pretty impressive. If all goes well with the Starship program, Within the next decade, we'll probably see SpaceX phase out the Dragon and Falcon 9 and go all in on Starship. But until then, we've got many Dragon flights to look forward to. One final shout out to Kaspar from Stanley Creative. Today's episode featured his Dragon 1 and Dragon 2 models, and his work, as you can see, is damn good. So I'm going to put some links in the description and urge you to go check out some of his work. That's it for today. I will see you next orbit.